Fun boy. It hasn't worked enough with you. Hello, everybody. Welcome hey, back to everyone. our welcome back to another episode and uh, of Max on Color. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Diego. How are you? I'm fine, Max. Here is a beautiful day. I'm in Bogota, Colombia, and I'm waiting for this show. I'm really excited about what Gino is going to talk today. Exactly. We are joined by Gino Amad Amadori. Yeah, I hope I'm not butchering your last name, Gino. I'm sorry. No, nah, it's so good. <laughs> Hello, guys. How are you? And Gino is a colorist based in LA, and um, he's been do, uh, he's been color grading since like I don't know, maybe since I haven't started yet. So um, I'm really looking forward to this uh, episode for sure because um, I'm I'm really looking forward to you know um, learn how Gino handle things in color grading, isn't it, Diego? Yeah, and actually, you know, we we've been talking in most of the shows about fiction, about movies, about I don't know, recreating looks and so on. Yeah. But we never talk about documentaries. And documentaries is such an important part of what we see in television. And I always say that, I mean, when you shoot a documentary, it's harder than when you yeah. shoot fiction. Also happen in grading. In grading, yeah. when you start grading documentaries, it's definitely more harder than when you have a fiction, when let's think that everything is more controlled. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And today uh, we, we're going to chat a little bit with Gino about that, how he approached that. And um, hopefully we can learn some tips and tricks along the way as well. And um, before we start, before we start, um, let me share you my screen and um, let me do some a little bit housekeeping. So um, if you are into... Um, webinars if you want to watch more webinars about either color grading cinema 4d or universe redshift or anything um you can go to max on color and uh, maxon.net sorry maxon.net slash events and there you'll be able to see um a lot of webinars um, um that is hosted 
at Maxon Training Team um, YouTube channel. So for example, on Monday, there will be um, the Mystifying Post Productions. And next up, Ellie will have another project breakdown about Redshift. So make sure you tune in if you are um, want to learn more about Cinema 4D, Redshift, or any of Maxon product. So um, if you're new to this webinar, I would love to point you out that you can get merchandise, um, free merchandise, free t-shirt, everybody. So if you're new to the show, you are eligible to get a one free t-shirt. And I will post the link into the chat um, uh, later. And um, you will have to follow that link and enter the code Cinema 4D Workflows to be able to enter the shop and you'll get you'll you'll get to order one of this t-shirt. All you need to uh, pay is just the small shipping cost. And um, this show is, is recorded. So if you want to um, re-watch the show, you can. You can simply go to YouTube and type in Maxon Training Team. And in the playlist, um, you'll be able to see the session that we are doing today with Gino. And um, before we start, um, let's say hi to our audience. Creative VFX Studio is in the chat. David Edwin. AE Explorations. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. And um, yeah, um, let's let's have let's fun. Have fun. Let's yeah. have fun. Exactly. So, um, Gino, thank you so much for joining us today, Gino. Thanks for having me. Really, yeah. Pleasure. It's 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 like what Diego said. We've been talking a lot about color grading, and we're we're we're, we're lo we love color grading and. We try to break down movies and we try to break down some tips and tricks. But what we haven't done this year is like talking about documentary and um, talking what, what why documentary project is so special. And um, I think it is like it is like the best approach to just talk to the expert and let the expert explain to us. And um, I think Gino is owning the, the documentary um, domain. And um, yeah, if you want to check more of Gino's work, you can go to gammapost.pe. Uh, and um, what about if we play one of your reel before we start, Gino? Excellent. That would be great. Thanks. Awesome. That was really nice. Thanks. That was really nice. Yeah, that was really nice. You have a mixture of commercials, some video clips, documentaries. It's the least that that has is documentaries, really. But uh, on the on the new one I'm doing, I'm gonna put some more stuff from documentaries because there's some really nice stuff that I've been working on, especially for uh, like reenactments and stuff like that, which I really like. Yeah, and I guess it's also because I mean, video clips, commercials is more clean image. 
it's more like attractive to see that at some point documentals that is more yeah it's beautiful but it will not be like a I don't know, like uh, aesthetic image yeah, and so on, right? It's less of a controlled environment altogether. So it, you're just shooting as you go. You've got different cameras. I mean, they're not all rigged and stuff. They're like more like uh, shoot and like, run and gun sort of uh, setup, right? So it's it's more like it's a bit harder sometimes because you don't have control environments and there's so many different uh, cameras being used or sources being used that it makes it a bit harder than all the rest i think as one of the audience pointed out in the chat it's really good <laughs> i do agree with that yeah oh, and thank um you. Thank you as so i much. see that as i see that you know you, you're not just making things look okay it looks normal it looks natural you just add some you know ma magic dust on it to make it like look very round and very finished and and very rich yeah thank you thank you so let's actually start by knowing you gino I mean, yeah. where are you now? Definitely, you're you're not American because of your accent. <laughs> where are you? Tell tell us about about you, man. Well, I'm I'm from Peru originally, and uh, I started working in Peru. Like oh, around. Gino froze a little bit. I'm, Gino American froze now. a little bit. Don't worry about it. Uh, let's now. wait for uh, Gino to come back a little bit. Am I back? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. There you go. He's back. Good, Perfect. Good, good. So yeah, I, as I was saying, I'm from Peru, um, born and raised there. I studied some in school in England and then went back to Peru where I finished off my, my, my studying. And uh, then I decided to start working in, in color grade, you know? So it was like, sorry, in, in editing first. So it was, uh, I, I'm originally from Peru, but I am now in LA, in, Calif in, sorry, in California, in Burbank um like for six months now almost and i'm trying to get into this exciting market you know uh, still working for peru and other places as well from here with remote so what was the reason for you to move from editing to color and first what did you study in england did you study economics laws architecture school school <laughs> at the school I, okay i think the thing is that when i was young like 14 i had a brain hemorrhage that like really messed me up a little bit so i wasn't doing great at school here so my mom and, and stepfather said that it would be best if i finish off my school in england because it was a right. smaller classroom so i finished off school there then went back to peru i really did not know what i wanted to do so my aunts and everyone like convinced me to study hotel management which mm. i did and halfway through that career i realized that i did not like that so much, but what I really was passionate about, and I had been passionate about it for like all my life, was was film and video, and then doing features and telling stories. You know, that was my my true passion, I think. And so when I realized that, I started working and started doing editing stuff, like really for my my cousins' birthdays and stuff like that. Really, because I mean, I had no I, I had no studies, so I, I had just. I had to start somewhere, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I started doing that. And then uh, I had like this luck that I was called from a company editor that they did documentaries. The company is called Patcha Films. And so they, they pulled me in as an editor. I had no experience. I, I told them I did, though, like in, in uh, like uh, uh, corporate video, I said. Yeah, but yeah. That was like my first step into editing and I did that for like what five years and then I realized that I also like to finish the the edits I did with some color and make them look nice make them look like as nice as I could really and that what that's was when I found out and I realized that I, I really like color grading and that there was a career that you could do wow. doing that you know because I had no idea that's good, but even even if something you say something important is that you born in a Spanish speaking country, and at some point, what gave you the opportunity to jump into editing documentaries was that you spoke speak English. Yes, yeah. that was a big plus, really, because they cared more about that than all my experience. Because this was all <laughs> yeah, stuff they, for... they actually don't care about your experience. They just say like, we need we need a person to speak English. Yeah, <laughs> basically, and I was really like. Uh, 
I mean, so, I was really dedicated. So they, they noticed that and they, they put me to test one week and they say, OK, you're in. And I had so, to learn so, that week. It was hard. <laughs> so that's probably your um, hotel management school helps, you know, because you now you, you can connect with people like better. Uh, because in the end, uh, doing color grading is like working with clients. It's probably like help you a little bit in there. Or yeah, massively. I, I, I feel I'm a good host when people come. Like I, I, yeah. I like to like say, "Hey, you need something, please." Yeah, you're uh, right. that's really you're great. Right. Yeah, so, Gino, since you are like uh, used to base in Peru and now is based in LA, and you are still moving, um, doing project in Peru and in LA. So, how how does it like? How, how does the industry looks like? How different is does the market looks like in in Peru and in LA? Is there like a significant difference? Well, it's there's much more work here, I think, or there was much more work before the strike, <laughs> at least, because as you know, I mean, I moved here in March, it ends of March, and the strike started like a month later. So I, I, I feel I haven't really had that full experience <laughs> of being here, but I've been working in independent features, uh, like I've done two or three, and I'm, I'm on the works now, I've been uh, the, the latest one. But yeah, I feel it's a bit slow at the moment, but I mean, it was like, there's, this is a huge market. There's so much opportunity here, much more than in Peru, no, I think. Yeah. And the prices are much better too. I mean, it's, That's even really though it's good. lower than before, it's better than what, what we get in Peru. I think that there's a bigger and a much more evolved industry here. It's, it's the Mecca for me. Yeah, and, and for example, what was the reason? Because, I mean, I think you start independent, then you start Gamma Post, that is your, your hotel. Sorry, your color company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you say, okay, let's, let's move to, to Burbank. Uh, when you already have clients in Lima, and you were like already established company over there. Yeah. Well, I started off, as, as you said, I started off, working for this company called Pacha Films, doing my editing and stuff. Then on Resolve 8.5, 8.6, I decided to jump to Resolve. I went to New York and uh, I took a course with Warren Eagles. So ah, he, yeah. he taught me way back. I took the three courses and I, I, I had it clear. Then I came back to Peru and well, went back to Peru. And then I started working in Da Vinci ever since then. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I haven't stopped. And I think back in the day, finding out like courses or finding out like a training material on color hard. grading is a little bit like it was a bit not hard, that, right? Yeah, it's I mean, Black like Magic today. had just bought, acquired uh, yeah. uh, Da Vinci, you know, from Da Vinci. So it yeah. was like a thousand dollars when I got it. It wasn't what it was now, and it was a bit more expensive before that. That's when I was starting to to notice it, you know, because I was looking yeah. into base light, I was looking into that, but it was so expensive that it was impossible for someone like me, an independent person to invest in that, you know? Exactly. And um, yeah, uh, Resolve has like a lower barrier to entry, to, so to say. I mean, and, it's um, more like you can expand from like, from a laptop or a, an iPad, you mm -hmm. can expand to whatever your, your budget allows you to, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a really great ap application. So speaking on applications, um, since you are choosing documentary project mostly and you're not mostly, but you know, you have majority, not majority. How do I say it? You, you do. You <laughs> you're do. doing a lot of documentary <laughs> projects, right? What, yeah, why yeah. documentary project? What's so special about documentary project? I mean, I know I not only do documentaries, I do lots, a lot of advertising yes. that you could see on the reel. Because exactly. I think that's the one that has like one of the best, like uh, it's money wise, it's like the best, I think, because it pays commercials. better. Yeah, yeah, commercials. It's a bit more cumbersome sometimes because it goes into a lot more detail than the others. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, documentary was like what I was born with in the industry, I think. And that's why I keep on doing it. I, I know how to do it pretty well. I've been doing it for 15 years now, 10 years grading it. So I, it's like easy for me just to, to, to yeah. my workflows and stuff, you know, and uh, I just like it. I don't know. It's, do, do you want it's to a give challenge us a, sometimes. Do you want to give us a peek on your workflow on documentary project? Sure. There? Of course. Of course. Awesome. Of course. Let I me, put something uh, together. All right. Perfect. Your... 
Yeah, and at some point while, while Gino is like sharing the screen, I, I will say that, you know, <laughs> documentaries is like you, you go more, I don't know, it's like you feel the story, you get the go engage with the characters, you know places, you know, it's like traveling, but without, with, without traveling actually, it's like staying there, knowing places, I'm sure probably if, if you are doing documentaries in Peru, you have done documentaries about the Incas empire, I don't know, food, all of that beautiful things you had it. So it's like grading and learning at some point, right? Well, yeah. it's uh, my documentaries are mostly about uh, current affairs stuff. I'm done so much stuff about narcos in Mexico and like right. narco mm -hmm. weapons. And it's, it's not, it's not like nice per se, <laughs> it's but it's learning at, at least. But yeah. you do learn so much, with it, you know, it's like, it's really interesting because there's some, as you say, there's learn behind every documentary. Yes. So it's, All right. It's great. Do you know, would you mind uh, reshare your um, screen? I think yeah, we sure. had a technical problem a little bit before. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll just reshare it right, right now. No problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, and what about you, Diego? Um, do you also do documentary projects? Um, I actually like a lot. I like a lot of documentaries. You know, at some point when I when I start edit uh, like studying, I don't know, film and so on. What mm -hmm. I wanted more is to to make documentaries because yeah. I like history. I like a lot of history. At some point, I like to tell stories. So before going to grading, before going to post-production, my main goal was, hey, I want to be, uh, I don't know, a director of documentaries. Wow. So I like that. I like, I mean, I like stories. I like stories. I like people. I like to know new things. So I definitely think my, that one of my favorite things to do is documentary and to watch, actually. I really exactly. I, I really love watching documentary. I mean, sometimes if you just want to relax and not to like immerse yourself in a story or or something, watching documentary can be a really great escape. I really love it. Yeah, yeah depend of the documentary, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think if you are if it's a documentary about narcos, it will be not escape so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All righty. Uh, let me make the screen bigger. Okay. All right. Perfect. Now you see so, it. All right, we say it good. Excellent. So, I mean, let me just get started with this. For me, one of the greatest challenges of documentary is that it's trying to get, like, put all the different pieces together. Uh, mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that you got stuff from, for example, Alexa, you got stuff from Sony, you got stuff from Red, you got stuff from Archive. They're all in different color spaces. So for me, the first step, to like documentary is getting organized with the footage, you know? And what I tend to do is I, I do, um, first I try to put them in colors so I know what comes from where, so it's easier. And then I also put a keyword on it so that, um, for That's example- That's in the edit page, right? Yeah, I'm on the edit page here. Well, the oh, keywords are put in the media page, actually. I see, I see. So cool. if I am doing like this black magic row, I can put uh, in the keyword here BMD, for example, no? and then that's tagged with that. And if I go to the color page and then I look in color and I, I just want to see that specific uh, BMD, I can mm -hmm. find it. So this makes it easy uh, with what I'm going to do next. No, just to have everything uh, well organized to start with, especially because it's not like a, a feature that you have like stuff made for a specific part and different shots of the same thing. It's that sometimes you get just one shot of one thing and, and you have to try and use it the best you can. No? Yeah. So it's, it's a bit, it's a bit more, more, um, you need more skill, I think for like storytelling with with documentary footage and because it comes from so many different uh cameras you also have to know how to manage it uh, accordingly so that when you get stuff in it's 
it's been like uh, developed if you want to say like that or color managed the correct way so that yeah. you can see the actual footage or the actual shot that the director of photography was intending no? yeah and actually you you explained one one thing that i i guess is really important because in most of the things when you're doing fiction and so on it's like you start grading and that's it here you are thinking about the footage because every yeah. footage will react different and in a documental you say you have a variety of footage and if you organize it uh, first then you will know what to expect and so on and if you're working in color management you will know what to or how to color manage that kind of footage exactly, exactly. and and i think i bet also uh during the footage acquisitions during the acquisition process itself i think like uh, the team don't have like enough time to like um tailor everything to get the photography like uh the best in the world so to say probably uh, there there will be a rush you have to capture a moment the light is not perfect and so on and so forth so um regarding that how, how do you manage like this um all this different um mix back of footage um apart from just um color coding them and and um but actually max them? maybe yeah. before that i i want to ask that like do you conform the documental yeah. gino exactly. or do you ask for a render and you cut it how is that workflow before like even go no, to the max I, question i do conform I do conform. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes do it myself. Sometimes I have an assistant doing it for me. Yeah. But I like conforming it because it gives me more flexibility as well. I have a workflow that uses remote grading. So mm -hmm. being remote, being that my my workflow, I need it to to like come from the the source. No, I don't need it to be cut because otherwise it doesn't work and it's slow. Yes, working with remote versions, right? Exactly. I use remote versions a lot, especially for documentary because remote versions allows me, for example, if there's several cuts of the same interview, yeah. okay, I grade one and they will all be graded the same. So that's, that's excellent. Wow. So I'm going to show you that in a bit. No, I, I, that's so at some point you, you prefer conforming because it makes you faster when grading yeah i prefer conforming. even when you can I mean, lose some time in conforming documentaries because as we say like documentaries grading documentaries it can be harder but conforming documentaries <laughs> is like definitely harder <laughs> well, when you have 15 15 years of experience yeah it's okay <laughs> that will need another sessions i guess for the conforming yes. part <laughs> yes it can be a nightmare it can be a nightmare to conform yeah. documentaries I mean, to yeah. be honest, I, as a colorist, I, I really don't like that part, you know, conforming. <laughs> I mean, nor right. do I, but you know what I've done? I've convinced all the editors I work with to start editing Resolve, so they are no, I don't have to conform anymore. I just get the project. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. what you have to do, just convince them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. harder on some industries like this one where, like, Avid is, like, a big player, right? But I think that in... For example, in Peru and stuff like that, where there's not a, such a big industry like leaning towards Avid, it's easier. Or with independence, no? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yeah, because, you know, I, I remember that and I ask you that because I remember when I was doing documentary for Nat Geo, uh, our workflow, because it was like a fast workflow, was to ask for a render file because we didn't have time for, for conforming. And I, I don't know if it happened with you, but... In documentaries, they spend a lot of time editing, so the calendar always breaks. So the time that you have for grading, first you can say, okay, give me five days, and then it's reducing to three, and then you're reducing to two. And then you say, yeah. okay, give, send me please this thing, send me please the timeline. This, this, was, this is one of my main things to, that I used to convince these people because I, I tell them, look, you could still be editing and I can start grading before you're done. So that's a yeah. big plus for you, for me, because the project will look better at the end. I'll have more time to dedicate to it. If you hired me for five days, I will be able to give you those five days. I don't have to like cramp those five days into two, which will like affect the project, I think, no, in a way. Yeah, yeah. And even as you say, like if you conform, you can ask for a, I don't know, for a fine cut before the picture lock, and then you color trace uh 
what they did with the picture log and it will be a support faster. Yeah, what I do is I, I'm using remote, uh, the, the cloud-based workflow. So yeah. I have them editing on proxies and yeah. I have all the high-risk footage and I just, I can see what they're doing. I can start doing tests while they're working. That's even better, collaborate. So, it yeah. will be like a, a picture log uh, yeah. open. That will be nice. That is nice. Yeah. And, and so the we way we have it set up. Resolve yeah. editors. Yeah, I'm trying to get those. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to get more people in it. But I mean, it's hard to get them to switch. Once they switch, they, they don't want to go back. That's the thing. So that's that's good. But the, the switching part is the hard one because it's shortcuts. It's convincing them that they're going to be slower at the beginning, but they yeah, eventually yeah. will get faster. It's a learning curve that I mean, you have to go through it, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. So now, sorry, Max, I interrupted your question, no but I think problem, it was important Larry. to see how how I we got the footage. <laughs> I mean, otherwise, we I, I will never know how about the conforming process. That, that's really sorry. Great. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what was the question, Max? You said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The color management. How do you do it? Okay. Man? All right. Oh, okay. So once I have everything sorted, I have all my 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 clips like like uh organized you could say i go to my yeah. color um to my color page or color tab and then i let me just get that out and i've got all of these shots with from different cameras okay so what i'm going to start doing is i have i've done these presets okay and each preset contains um um like a node structure that contains a color space transform that will transform the from camera log to whatever I'm working on. What I usually do is I work on the color space of what's been shot the most of what the main camera is. For example, in this situation, we're going to do this like Ari. So Ari will be our, our main camera here. Yeah. And what I do first is I go to the end to that uh, timeline level. I do a node with the color space transform in here. Okay, and I put the Ari white gamut 3 and Ari log C3 to rec 709 uh, gamma 2.4. Okay, so that will get me like at the end uh, something that is uh, like developed or like color managed. Yes. For example, map, this is map to the image. Yeah, yeah, map to the image. So this image is Ari. So what, what happened here is when I put this, it changes from this to this, which is what we want. So this is all black magic. So what do we do when, when we already have everything sorted, when we have the color space transform at the end, so like our output color space? Uh, I will go here to clips and use my metadata to make it easier. So I want to see all of the Ari shots. I press here. These are all my Ari shots. I just, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. The first thing I want to do is I want to use the remote, right? The one we talked about. So I'm using local at the moment. So I want to change to use remote. See now all of these clips are linked. So. If I do something to this, it will go to the others, you see? So if I, for example, change the color in this, if I just over or put my exposure high, you see they're all being affected at the same time because it's the same, it's the same clip. It's just different cuts of it. So mm -hmm. that's a remote, that's a remote uh, advantage, you know? You do, however, have to be careful because sometimes you don't know, or sometimes, especially in documentary, if you're shooting a person and then you turn, or, turn to the other side, light might vary and you can see that shot and not know it's linked to another shot. And if you start moving that, you could be moving like five other shots the wrong way, you know? So you have to always be alert to this little symbol here when you're doing like any sort of drastic. So what you uh, do in that case is, do you create a new version? Yes, or... exactly. I create a new right. version. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, perfect. And at the end of when you have like almost everything match, do you like reset the or not reset like switch the remote versions to local to start like fixing every shot? Or do you uh, finish with the remote version? 
in documentary, I think it's with a remote version mostly because there's not right. that many masks and stuff, you know? Yeah. And if I'm going to do masks, for example, on this, what I do is if I'm going to have a mask done on her face, yeah. I just go to the next one and, and I have this on, like the frame. I just move it to where I want it and then just track it and move it to where I want it and I just track it shot by shot. So, for example, if at the end, like uh, the director says, uh, I think this is too contrasty, it's just this interview, I can then just, for example, use my notary at the end and uh, tweak it and this, they all will be tweaked, like, accordingly, right? All right. Okay, so look, yeah, I, for, that's, what, that's really what I'm going to do, yeah, what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to start putting everything to, to its place. So this is, this is a uh, black magic. I'm going to put this uh, note structure on these. I'm going to see what other ones I have, for example. Um, okay, I want to see the Sony. Okay, this is Sony. So I'm going to put the Sony on this one. Okay, and so on, right? So I start like looking at my different uh, keywords and adding the different um, the different node structures I have for each different camera to it. You know, at the end, what will happen is we're gonna end up with a with footage that, if you play through it, I mean, it's all from different cameras, yeah. but it will it's all been like transformed into seven or nine. Or in this case, it's all being transformed into, in in for example, this is Sony, okay? But because we're working on the on the what's it called Ari color space because yeah, that's yeah. what we have the most. What I do is I color space transform from Sony to Ari, and then at the end it goes from Ari to Rec Seven O Nine. Or if I'm going to HDR, I'll use a different flavor of the output, right? No, right. And so, same for archive footage, which you also get a lot, like stock footage, footage and stuff. I use Rec Seven Hundred Nine, so we transform Rec Seven Hundred Nine to the Ari, and then back again. So you're what? kind of like creating presets for your workflow, right, Gino? Yes, so and these presets are exactly easily, yeah. What you do to so create these presets is really easy. Once you have established, like for example, mm -hmm. I know this is Black Magic, Ursa. So what I do is I make something like this on top, you know, and then I go to my color tab and I have to make sure I'm on this clip that holds the, 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 the structure, node yeah. Structure, structure. Yeah. And then what I do is I just come here. I'm going to delete this one. Okay. Yeah, delete. And, I'm, I'm, and I just grab a still. So whenever, nice. imagine this doesn't have this. Just All right. middle press here and voila, we're yeah. done. That's nice. So, so um, you, you are saving exactly the same node structure except for the um, color space transform, right? Yeah, exactly. The color nice. space transform, yeah. I mean, it varies. For example, this has a color yeah. space transform that is from Canon. This one has one from red. This one has from black magic. So I have different ones that it's as easy as just pressing on it, no? Yeah. And so yeah, That's so, a good so, way to work, yeah. So the question is, why Why are you transforming all of the cameras to one camera? Is that going to give you an advantage or grading, or what is the reason? I mean, we're all working on the same color space, so if I'm going to apply any LAT or any correction, we're on the same like color space. And, Family. And Even that if, if it's a GoPro or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I I like it because there's lots of lots for Ari as well. Yeah. So it it's it's a nice. I think it's I like the 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 curve, and it's it's a, it's a nice. Yeah, and the reason nice that you space. are doing this by node and node by let's think by a, a project settings yeah, and a color a, framework a, like Aces or like Resolve yeah. a color manage what is the what is the reason that you select doing this process yeah i think it gives you more flexibility because especially for documentaries when you get footage or when you're doing <clears throat> hdr stuff especially for sdr i haven't had this issue but yeah. for hdr what happens is when you have like rec 709 footage that has the whites all the way to 100 nits 
I mean, when you uh, map that to P, PQ or uh, P3, direct 2020 and 1,000 nits, I mean, you're getting that 100 nits turned into 1,000 nits, and it's too much. Sometimes things are clipped, and it looks really bad. So what yeah. I tend to do with that is I go into my color space transform, and then I use my custom output, and I just tweak this, you know? So if, if I want to, if I'm, if this is like over the top for me, I'll just lower it or I just adjust this specific parameter and it helps me with all the archive footage, which sometimes is like yes. really bad quality. So for me, that's a big plus. Yes, Another so thing is when you're using ACES, sometimes colors tend to break. Yeah. And the advantage this gives me is that if I'm working on, on one of these two nodes before the color space transform, I can tweak stuff before my ACES, you know? So mm -hmm. it gives me yeah. lots of flexibility for that. Yeah, so at some point you have like flexibility and and you can say, I can you can play with a tone mapping that you cannot do that by no. clip when it's exactly. project settings. And also you have two nodes for preparing the footage. And if you're going to use Fusion as well, I mean, I don't know if it does it still, but it used to do it where you just, the, I mean, the color uh, space was not represented correctly when you used to have that uh, yeah. like project management uh, work, workflow, right? Yeah, the color I, I think it is. It is still a problem to this so day. I mean, now I, have I don't have that problem. I don't have that problem yeah. now because I just go to Fusion and it's it's whatever the footage is i mean yeah fusion is before color grading so at yeah. some point it's like yeah the clip that you do in fusion it will be like the result you will be i don't know grading in in color exactly so it's not like see it's 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 a uh, flat and that's how i want to work on that and and it's good yeah that's i mean nice. it gives me more flexibility a lot more flexibility that's why i use it i think and also, I mean, the node structure for me is very important as well, because this is something I learned from a, from a, a, a great colorist, uh, Walter Volpato, who's... Oh, I love uh, Walter a, Volpato. A I learned a lot from and, that guy. Yeah. And he's taught me a lot, and I've seen lots of videos from him. I mean, I'm a big fan of him. And he's, he taught me, and he learned from another colorist as well, this node structure which is for, mm. this is a, a node structure that I'm, I've started using. I haven't modified it yet. I've, I've seen he's modified his, but I'm pretty yeah. happy working with this. And it gives me that sort of order that I like working in for like, I have stuff that's already like prepared to, to allocate stuff in, you know, for example, my noise reductions here. And I have like the, the render thing put on as well so i got the note cache and i have it in on so if i turn this on it won't lag when playback it just renders it and then it plays smoothly and i can do whatever tweak afterwards and no problem and my so I have, station form i have one question about that gino it's like i don't know i'm, I'm the kind of colorist that don't like so many notes mm -hmm. because when matching it's hard. So I remember that the last documentary I did, uh, the, the main color is he plays like 20 notes. And then we took that episode and we said like, what? And then we need to match, match, match. So at the end, what we did was like reduce that, I don't know, that 20 node structure to seven nodes, eight nodes. And it was easy for matching. What do you think? Because right now you have a big node structure that in fiction, I don't know, yeah, maybe, but in documentaries when matching is harder, definitely harder. How do you feel it? I, I mean, I use the base to match everything. Yeah. That's my main note. I mean, once I have the base done, I mean, for me, my, 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 like my, my, the way I work is, this is my, like my hero note really. That gives me like, like the, All right. the basis to everything. And then I have my, these are my, my, like my eight main element no it would be like the sky maybe yeah you know this is like the earth or the, the ground or the, the floor then i have like this is for characters like my main character one main character two main character three which are specific for that and this as you can see this all comes from the base you know the, the base 
goes here and then you can do the picking of the, the sky or whatever and the same for here and this note won't affect these either you see yeah because you're not doing something global it's like secondary and so this is specific to characters which won't affect anything else then we have here for high and lows and curves curve uses so this is for beauty like if you want to take out wrinkles and stuff and these are all like free to get like different elements of the shot and then after all of this is done like where i got my lighting correct and my color and everything i have these notes which are like like trims for whatever i got from this right. so i start trimming one and i can for example put a, a, a look here and and for example and then start like uh, this is not the best shot for this but for example i can then have this uh, put back into like a uh, different color and stuff like that. You see, I can start moving stuff around. This is a very bad example, but, <laughs> but yeah, so you the know trim what I mean. Is, I are, so the trim is actually after um, the base grade. Yeah, these trims are after yeah. the base grade and after the details as well. You see the secondaries yeah. and the different elements on the shot. So this is like an over all of what you've done here, like fix or, or tweak. If you want to put the highlights up or low or, or, or the lows. Then we got OFX, and then we have like the the vignettes, like they're already like like done for you here. So right. you just go in here, and and you're done. You just move whatever you want. And then these are all like trims for after your presentation, you know, where you have like the okay, ah, uh, no, this is like too too saturated or or too this or too that. You just tweak things around. And the advantage of having that same structure on all the notes is that. For example, if you get asked to modify all these shots because they say, oh, it's too high, the highlights are too high or it's too contrasty, you just go here and, for example, you just take away contrast and then you go here to color and then go to uh, ripple node ripple changes node. to selected clips. Yeah. And this will and do it yeah. for all of them, you see? Mm -hmm. So this will not happen if you have a... Uh, no structure that varies from shot to shot yeah so this is this is a very fast correction method you know? so now that you talk about like a, a shaded note how do you use that shaded note in your structure like i don't have i really don't use shared notes that yeah. much what i do if i want to share stuff or looks what i what i, what I do is i establish groups for yeah. example if I want to establish a look for the Mercedes shots at the beginning, what I do is I do a right click and then I do um, add into new group and then I put like a benzo look. Okay, and then I have this where I can, I don't know, if I want to put a lot into this, I can put a lot in here. You know, with, uh, I mean, I'm just going to do. An easy one. Yeah, this one. So I just put this on and, and then this will give the look for the whole thing, you know? Or I can tweak stuff here as well, I know. If I tweak stuff here, I can just like put a bit warmer the shots. Like this. And this will be applied to all of it. So for documentary, this is great. Especially yeah. when I got like reenactment stuff. So I group all the reenactment stuff together that's from the same thing. And I just put the lot or the look I want on it, and then I tweak stuff like independently, you know. So God. for me, this is more like that. I don't use the the shared notes that much. So Gino, on a question, I have a questions on uh, because we were mentioning about the the look and and so on. Um, I have a questions about your process, your um, thinking process of creating looks. Um, first, is that like, do you create looks first, and then after that, matching the, uh, under the look, or do you like um, balance everything first, and then after that, you create the look on top of that? And um, the so, let's answer that first, and then after that, let's um, let's go to another questions. Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> <I'm> curious. <laughs> I mean, depends. Sometimes they're, they're, they're shooting with a lot on top already and, and I have to mm -hmm. use a lot to balance things out. But some other times when I'm not sure what look I want to give it, I try to balance things out with a base first, to, like get them like in a ballpark, like all looking the same or as much the same as I can. Because that makes yeah. it so much easier at the end when I'm going to apply the lot, they will all look the same. 
because no and i think it. also it's like okay in fiction probably most of the shots will look similar yeah yeah they have control light they have so you can put a lot at the end have a, a or bigger, even bigger a budget too yes <laughs> and everything will match everything will fit automatically in that look yeah. but i mean i'm i'm sure in in, in a documentary let's let's think that is not a documentary with big budget a normal or an independent documentary if you choose <laughs> you put a look in the post group <laughs> or even a look lot everything will be look different so i'm yeah. i'm agree with your your strategy you know it's like first I mean, you need to balance yeah. everything i know and put everything in levels i mean yeah. look, what i've done with the people i work with documentaries i mean it's everything is to do with the communication you have with the director of photography i think i mean if you're friends with him and you have a good relationship with them i mean on these last documentaries i've been doing they're all hdr and with i mean because i have knowledge of hdr i've transmitted that to the dp and we've been doing tests and stuff like that we used the shogun 7 uh, monitor to do tests and that's that was the monitor he was shooting with but before this, they didn't even calibrate the monitors they were using. So you mm. can imagine that I, I get like a green, the same <laughs> interview, two cameras, one green, one red. So that was painful to, 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 like, to match, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and you never get it to look exactly the same either. It's, it's like really hard or very, very hard. So what I told them is to get one of these, like, uh, what are these called? Like the color charts, you know? these color charts, okay? Uh, the yeah. Exactly, so whenever I get the interview, it, I match it in three seconds, literally, yes. because the, I have the, 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 the card and I just tuk, 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 match it, okay, we're done. I can start That's being creative, nice. you know? Because matching has, nice. I mean, it's not creative, you know? Matching yeah. is just like, you, you gotta do it. But then comes the creative part for me, it's like the... Yeah. the yes, the, so, the, so the at some point you're it, doing you know? more of these cards for matching colors, because you are doing color space transform in your other nodes. This one is more for matching, right? Yeah, I mean, that's right. what, that's what, that's one I, I use for matching, really. That's just, once I have my color space transform, maybe I can use this on the, on the, the balance node, and it just gives me an instant thing. There's some other times when they just have to grab the camera and start shooting. They did not have time to do much. So that those shots are the hardest ones, you know. That's that's yeah. the beauty of documentary. I mean, you get stuff that's really nicely shot, and you get stuff that's a challenge to make it look nice with the other stuff, you know. That's yeah, that's good. That's nice. So you're mostly uh, using LUT to create your uh, main looks, so to say, Gino. Nah, sometimes I use LUT. Sometimes I use um, I use my own. Like, mm -hmm. like I just tweak stuff around. I'm using a lot of the HDR wheels to do looks. Yeah, because it gives me like the shadows, it grabs onto the shadows really nicely and I can like turn the shadows a bit like magenta or like bluish or like teal, whatever speaking, I want. Of, and... Yeah, I just want to say, speaking of looks, I think you, you really, you got to check it out, man. You got to check uh, check out Magic Bullet looks from Maxon as well. Yeah, let's see how it works. Very good things, yeah. Let's have, you ever, have you ever seen uh, how Magic Bullet look works, by the way? I've used it a while back. Oh, well, oh, I haven't used it, it since, has so evolved. I'm really, I really want to see it. It has evolved. Um, let me show you my screen, if you don't mind. Yeah, 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 let's see, let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> I think Diego and I, we, we play it around a lot with Magic Bullet Looks in this channel. So one thing is that, you know, um, the newest iterations of Magic Bullet Looks is that now it supports Aces. So if you want nice. to work in Aces... It has open color IO uh, support in it, so you can go anything, um, you know, in and out. And also, if you don't like to work with a with Aces, there is also another um, uh, mode that is called the 1D color handling. And here you can just strip off um, the Aces transform and just do the 1D transform. So with this 1D transform, only the gamma, only the tone curve got. Um, transform but the color space remain as um so as the is. color space curve it doesn't affect it it just like if i have my curve already set up like with my colors color management thing i can put that for example on my group with just just gives me yeah. the look right nice i think if you if you have like as you set up i, I think you set it up in ari 
if you want to, you can just use one one D color handling, set it to nice. uh, Ari Loxi in yeah. and Ari Loxi out. Then that it should be okay. It, it but will if not you be want any transformation at some point, it will be yeah. like a bypass, right? Exactly. That's All right. nice. And um, what's what I really love with Magic Bullet looks is that you know there are like some tools that add texture to your um, to your clip. So for example, and this is like very hard to to replicate like by hands. So for example, this um, optical diffusions, if you can see in the in the in the highlights, and also the halations, because normally when we are working with a uh, some some film print or film negative model, we need to add the halations. And mm. what's nice is that there's two optical diffusions and halations. It's actually based on the same engine. And they are created, use the, uh, they are created by, um, you know, by, uh, by, how do you call it? Uh, respecting the, the principle, the rendering principle. It's called the um, energy conserving. So, what it means is that it doesn't matter how hard you push the optical diffusions or halations, the exposure will not change because it's not generating its own light, but it's just like using whatever light available in the scene and give you the output. And, and that works in 32 floating as well, like, like Da Vinci? Yeah. Nice. Oh, um, it has its own interface, so it's okay. not how do you call it? It's not um available in the in the OFX the setting. Okay. So you need to go into the the designer interface. Yeah. And um, nice. What's what's nice is that. Also, what I want to point out that sometimes people love to work with um a lot of LUT, right? So for example, if I just want to use um any LUT, for example, just use like Kodak 2383 in this case, you can use Magic Bullet looks not to um, create all the majority of your looks. Uh, so for example, if I just want to add texture, you can, you can just like, for example here, let me just set it to aces in and out. And if I just want to add diffusions and grain and confirm it, I can just, I can also do that. So it, you can really pair it with um, your favorite LUTs and, you know, any other Yes, at some point it's an advantage that is like flexible color manage. That's what I like it. Yeah, especially if you're color managing things in, in, in the node. It's... Yeah, and, and at some point it's like it's giving, for example, in this case, uh, Max talk about aces because Max love aces. <laughs> 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 but Gino say, no, I'm using another color manage and... Mm -hmm. It, it still can work. It still can work even in Acers or in the color manage that is doing Gino right now that is more control color manage, I, I think so. Yeah. And Da Vinci White Gamut as well. Yeah. And at the da moment, Gamut. yeah. At, at the moment, it's not natively supporting the Da Vinci White Gamut, but there are plenty of work, uh, work around on, on that. That was my go to like color space before I started working in that like native camera color space. I used to work yeah. in Da Vinci White Gamut a lot because it like really put everything together nicely, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Say, Max. I think a lot of like colorists love that because it doesn't have the RRT, the rendering uh, uh, reference transform, like what ACES do, like this filmic contrast that they do in the in the output uh, transform, isn't it? So it you sticks too much. Like like it's too contrasty for me. I don't know. Like the blacks are too like on the floor. Yeah, but actually, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, for example, in the color space transform node, Gino actually can control that tone mapping curve. He can mm. control to normal, to Da Vinci, to luminous mapping, yeah, and he can some nice. sliders to control it. Yeah. So, so I, I'm definitely supporting Gino's workflow because of oh, that. Oh yeah. Something else I did not say. I mean, when I'm working, usually I see people working like in their color management, their their timeline color space. It's in Rec 709. Yeah. yeah. I use the the Ari Log C3 or whatever, or Da Vinci White Gamma, or like. I don't use, I try not to like constrain myself to the 709 because it like limits me, especially with the HDR tool. Yeah, exactly. Because by default, it is always referring to the project management, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and like, it will like cut the highlights and stuff. No, I think, yeah. for example, look here, 
you see it goes past the 100 nits you see yeah so you have all the 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 capability of going from speculars to highlights and then from lights etc I mean, that's, that's a great tool. so we talk already about matching looks uh, but i think the hardest thing in documentaries you know is what everyone hates and it's called qc right mm. <laughs> yeah yeah. Yes. How you manage with QC? Because I know you work with Nat Geo, and I used to work with Nat Geo also. And I remember that we delivered something, and then the QC has like, I don't know, like three pages of progress, 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 progress. How you mm. manage that? I, it's, I, I barely get like comments for image. What, I, what, what we do sometimes fail in is like uh, audio. Just getting the audio the right tracks or getting the configuration for the audio. That's what like it's harder for us. But with with the workflow we have, the the color and the light will will constrain to whatever you tell it to, so it won't go over. So it's, it you won't be like blowing up like limits or stuff like that at all. So I haven't had I I, I mean what what we do for QC is we look out for stuff that could happen on the render, for example, maybe like glitches yeah. and stuff like that, that can happen, no? Yeah, I, maybe dead pixels and so uh, on. Dead pixels, stuff like, yeah, they, they, I have never had anything for dead pixels. I try and fix them, but I'm, I'm sure I've missed some, but what they usually see is that your, your like lows are not like too milky or that like, if it's like, yeah. There's no curves on the on the bottom side of the of the scopes that you you're not like crushing it and then just lifting it and it just looks bad or, or there's like different uh, limits on the blacks but I mean if you did your job well I mean you shouldn't have that I think no? yeah but I think it's something that you need to spend time it's like and inter yeah you have to I mean what I usually do is I export and then have someone other than me look at it because I'm like yes. so saturated with the project that I won't be able to find anything. And I usually, when I do that, I start changing stuff and I don't want that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and also like reading the, the manual specs of the TV channel. Uh, like yeah. That's, I mean, that's the first thing you have to do because you have to know what you're going to deliver to, you know? So you have, that's the first thing you have to do to get your, 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 your settings the right way. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's and and I think it's, it's it's really a hard point in documentaries because you have a lot of kind of footage, so quality control is is big. And for yeah. example, uh, talking about the scopes, do you use internal scopes from Resolve yeah. or do you use external? And the reason I'm saying is because I mean, talking about quality control, is like you want to see the image not from the software. And you want to see the image directly from the GPU, from the video card. So how is your workflow about that? Here, I don't have an external, I have external scopes here, but they're like 1080. So I, I could use those. Uh, they're yeah. like, uh, they're like old school. Look, I'm going to show you. Yeah, they are old, old school, like really old school. Yeah. That, <laughs> is that a leader? Tektronix? Yes. Yeah, leader. Literal yeah, yeah. Tectronics, yes. Yeah, and I, yeah. I, I remember that I loved that ones. I loved that one. They were so expensive. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm using internals. In Peru, in Ga at Gamma Post House, we have the, the, the Da Vinci external ones. Yeah. So we have that on top of the monitor. So when we're playing back, we can just have, we just look up and we can see it's, it's in range. Yeah. But, I mean, usually we get sometimes like complaints about like the archive because sometimes it's interlaced and yeah. I mean, there's nothing to do because they've like, they did not deinterlace it before they turn it to deinterlace, you know, so it, yeah. you can see all the lines and there's nothing you can do. About, I mean, I haven't found a workaround yet to fix that. Yes, it will be more restoration that than turning all the things <sighs> into one. I mean, and you don't have budget for that. I mean, for a documentary, I think. So if they just live with it and they just, you just have to say, yo, this has these issues. So yeah, yeah, be yeah. mindful about that before you throw the QC back at me, saying I failed. All right. Yeah. But that's awesome. That's, I mean, I remember that, yeah, we, we do have that, that the scopes, the technical scopes. 
and that were really expensive. And what I like is that they were showing a lot of gamut, uh, like alerts, luminance things. And at some point we were like finishing the grading and then play and then look at the scopes. And it was showing you like problem here, 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 fix it. I mean, I'm always looking at the scopes while I'm working. So it's yeah. like, I try to make the, the, the shadows be at the same level or as close as they can, depends on the, the scenery and stuff. But yeah, I mean, if, if you if you do a good job, I think when doing the yeah. grade, you shouldn't have any problems at the end, I think, unless there's a bug or something at the expo. That's good, that's good. So I think for, for I don't know, say Max, yeah, I just want to like chime in because um, Gino just man mentioned um, bug on the export. It just reminds me though, but because you know, at the end, it's like the delivery matters. You know, um, is there any um, tips and tricks that you can share with us uh, regarding um, delivery, Gino? I mean, delivery is pretty straightforward. It's basically what they're asking you to deliver. So you have a bunch based of on the stuff. specs. Then yeah, yeah, based on the specs. So what I used to do something is something really important. Is like ask 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 for the manual and and do what they want it so i mean cool. imagine you don't ask for the manual and you start grading and then you say yo i wanted that in p3 and you're like oh <laughs> I <can't do> so. <laughs> so yeah get I mean, the delivery have... right before starting the project yeah and having this color managed as well i think it's so important yeah. because if something was to happen along the way you could always change your output and then just tweak a little bit and then you, you're basically done but uh if you're not color managed, you're, I think you're not so great. <laughs> That's yeah. I mean, for deliveries, it's important to have the resolution correct, the frame rate correct, and the... Uh, and then the audio configuration correct. The, ah, the audio configuration, <laughs> man. Yeah, that's the thing that always bugs me. I mean, and that, yeah, I mean, you have to work with this. Yes, see, this is something that I just noticed when I, I am 12-bit now. For my my the, the the footage I have here, and when I go to Fairlight, I think it goes to ten bit, but it doesn't matter. But yeah, what I do is I sometimes when they ask me for um, for different configurations, I just have to configure it through Fairlight, no, to the bus yeah. format, and you have to change it here, put whatever you need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, it's really important when you're before you deliver just i always watch it through you know just and check out uh this um what's it called um the mixer because it will show up in the mixer too you know yeah so if, if if you have if you're pretending to give them 5.1 and you only see like two channels bouncing around you know you're you're not doing the right thing you know you have yeah. to have the the thing correct so basically keep an eye out for all the details keep an eye out for what they're asking you for and uh, i mean hdr deliverables are a bit more tricky because they sometimes ask you for to limit to 2020 not to limit to p3 on a 2020 color space and stuff yeah. like that and when you're working on the automated like uh, color space uh, management or uh, color management yeah. in davinci it's easier but when you're doing it with notes there's like an extra note you have to put on. That's good. That's Got good. it. That deserve another um, sessions for, for just for the deliverables. Yeah. yeah. HDR I, especially. And, and now that, vision. Yeah. And now that you're talking HDR, I I really want to know your opinion. Is because, I mean, we we have talked in the show about HDR in film, HDR in series, HDR in video clips, but I I seriously think that hdr in documentaries gives more definitely more yeah, because i, like I mean that. my point of view is that in films people are kind of scared about what hdr can do yes it's doing something but they is they they conserve the same aesthetic and so on but hdr in documentaries looks absolutely beautiful so what do you what is your idea about it i mean as you say, people are scared. People are scared yeah. because, I mean, it's human to be scared of change, I think. So yeah, this yeah, is a yeah. big change. That It's a big leap that going from 100 to 1,000, going to a bigger color space, a wider, broader color space. I mean, it's shooting differently, having different exposure to things. I think it's, it's an amazing technology. I really like it. I really like what it does to, um, to documentaries, as you say. 
I've been pushing it for music videos as well, which not many people are doing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to do that as well because I I I have the the way, I have ways of doing it because I have the monitor and everything. But I also I mean the more I do of it, the more practice I have on it, and the better I will get on it. So I'm trying to always do stuff in in each year, and I think that yeah, I mean you have so much details on the shadows that it doesn't all have to be brighter, you know. It it can be really dark, like like what you're used to seeing, but you have more details on those shadows. So yeah. It gives yeah. you a different ambience or a different mood to things or it gives you more, I don't know, it's nicer. But yeah, it's, it's hard for some people to wrap their head around what advantages it could give you on. on yeah, and, and I product. always think that they want to continue doing the same, the same of what they like. But I mean, it's, they... it's the same as editors changing to resolve. I mean, it's, it's a learning curve and you're going to mess up on the way, I'm sure. And I mean, Everyone's messed up on the way on the learning curve, so I think people don't exactly. like messing up. That's good, nice. Definitely, yeah. we 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 really need to revisit that um, idea of talking about the HDR delivery uh, one more yeah. time with Gino. Perfect. Yeah. Right. Sounds great. I have my eyes on the on the clock. It seems like um, too bad that we are coming to an end. <laughs> every good thing has to mm. come to end. <laughs> and um um i really would love to, i mean thank you gino once again for sharing your experience oh. with us. and um fully hopefully you will come back in the in the in the show you know and talk more about the thank you guys uh, so much for having me thank you guys so much for having me really I've had yeah. a great time. It's been a pleasure no we it's really been a pleasure. it's been yeah, a great it's, time it's a pleasure the hour just went by really fast <laughs> the hours just went by really fast, yes. And um, yeah, um, let me just grab your screen and do the housekeeping again. So um, again, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us today. And um, if you want to check more of the Maxon events, uh, please go to maxon.net slash events. And there you'll see um, there are plenty of webinars coming on Maxon channel. And if you want to get your free T-shirt, make sure that you go into the link that is posted on the chat today. And be sure to use the code um, cinema 4 workflows to enter the, uh, the store. And you, you, you can get one of this T-shirt free of charge. And um, if you want to watch the recording or any other webinars recording, go to YouTube and type in Maxon Training Team, and you'll be able to watch the recording uh, of all the webinars. And um, I also would love to thank you, Kyle, for producing the the show. Kyle is with us today and he's just behind the curtain. Thank you thank so you much. Kyle. And thank you, Kyle. Yeah. And um, thank you, Diego. And thank you, Gino. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll meet again soon. Right? Sure. We will. Thank you, Diego. Well, thank you, Max. We had a great you. time. Ciao. Awesome. And with that being said, my name is Max. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next Max on Color. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. Bye.